The conversation starts now. It's 420, it's Thursday, it's time for THC Live. I'm Nikita Graham. And I'm Shane Foxman. Welcome to another edition of THC Live, coming to you every Thursday at 4.20 Pacific time, as we are located somewhere in the Lower Mainland. In Maine. the Lower Mainland, a secret location. Yes, yeah, so you can watch us on Facebook, of course, as you are right now, but there are other ways. We are also, we have a YouTube channel now, and it is thclive.tv, where you can check out all the episodes, shorter episodes, growing pains. Different segments of the shows, past episodes, whatever you need, you can check out our YouTube channel. And you can also contact us during the show if you have questions for our guests. Yeah, there's a bar down below us. There's a comment section. So you can go down. I thought I could see it from there. <laughs> Never mind. You can go down there and check it out. And we'll be opening the floor uh, up to... Questions. The guests, yes. questions for the guests. Exactly. Sometimes uh, you have something on your mind that we might not get to, so we appreciate uh, any input you would have. And speaking of guests, Jam Pack Show once again today. We do. We're going to start the show off with Chris Bennett. And give a little information about Chris. An author, a, a cannabis historian. He focuses on the relationship between marijuana and religion. And if you're someone who goes, what, there is a relationship between marijuana and religion? Well, according to Mr. Bennett, he's written four books about it. So he's going to join us uh, via Skype. Uh, we'll get uh, his take on the uh, relationship relationship as it dates back uh, thousands of years. Also, we're going to take you on a tour of uh, a dispensary. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> you see them all over town, and if you've never been in one, it can be rather intimidating. Uh, you, you go, you know, I'd like to go in there. I'd like to see what it's about, but a little uncomfortable. We're going to uh, pull back the veil, you might say, and take you inside uh, a dispensary coming up later on the show as well. We also have Haley and Cheryl Rose, uh, mother-daughter, and they're here to talk about uh, epilepsy and their fight and journey throughout the years. Yeah, you know what? We've had doctors on the show talking about prescribing uh, cannabis and uh, marijuana to their patients, and obviously that's one side of it. What about hearing from a patient th themselves and how it's changed their quality of life and outlook? So uh, as we said, uh, Haley and Cheryl Rose will join us uh, in the studio. But first time for some history. Yeah, and since I've been away, I'm quite excited to see this next episode. It is number six of Growing Pains. Following passage of the Controlled Substances Act in March 1971, President Nixon I'm not a crook puts Attorney General John Mitchell in charge of the Schaefer Commission to advise on the appropriate scheduling of marijuana. But Mitchell, who's on Nixon's shortlist to become a Supreme Court Justice, is a skeptic of the gateway theory. Uh, 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 uh. Mitchell demands proof that marijuana really does create dependency. He wants facts and evidence backed by science. Science rules. He commissions more than 50 studies. Meanwhile, in Canada, after two years and $4 million, the 1972 Ladane Commission Report on Cannabis, a.k.a. the Commission of Inquiry into the Non-Medical Use of Drugs, you gotta love bureaucracy, don't you? is presented to the Liberal government. The Ladane Report concludes that cannabis use does not cause violence or violent crime. And prohibition wastes police time, clogs the justice system, provides funds for organized crime, and creates a subculture with a complete lack of respect for the law. While the commission does not recommend legalization, it does recommend removing criminal penalties for possession. They also advise further research be done, saying the law on the books is at extreme variance with the facts. Politicians give the report lip service, but no changes are made to Canada's Narcotic Control Act for 25 years. Get used to disappointment. Hello? In the U.S., John Mitchell's 1,100-page Schaefer Commission report, wow, that's a lot of pages, shatters everything the government has claimed about marijuana since the 1930s. Wow. Wow, indeed. As a matter of fact, half the population thinks you can die from an overdose of marijuana, but the commission finds zero fatalities ever recorded. The report also completely dismantles Harry Anslinger's gateway theory, saying, the fact should be emphasized that the overwhelming majority of marijuana users do not progress to other drugs. So what are the gateway drugs? 
tobacco and alcohol. The Schaefer Commission describes marijuana as not an innocuous drug, but says it does not constitute a major threat to public health. They further conclude that marijuana should be decriminalized. Nixon ignores the report. Marijuana is listed as Schedule 1. Nixon then creates the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, which consolidates virtually all federal powers of drug enforcement into a single agency. Limitless power! As for Attorney General Mitchell, he never did get that Supreme Court appointment. Always interesting. And, you know, you see what happened there and you see all the different reports and all the government commissions that all talked about kind of the opposite of what the government was telling the general public. Yeah. When it came to marijuana, it seems like the war on drugs, at least as we've gotten through growing pains, built on misinformation. It's kind of like a personal war almost because it's like, I don't want, I don't want this because of, you know, well, not ridiculous based, release Not reasons. based on anything scientific. Yeah. Uh, Time to uh, join our uh, first guest uh, on the show this week, THC Live. We're going to do, uh, do it via Skype. We're going to be joined by author Chris Bennett. Uh, four books, as we said, he's a uh, cannabis historian, focuses on the relationship between cannabis, marijuana, and religion. Uh, Chris, thanks very much for doing this. We appreciate it. Hey, lovely to be on your show. It looks like a really uh, professional setup. Very great to see. <laughs> well, you know what? From Skype, from where you are, <laughs> yeah. it looks extremely professional. If you're sitting here, <laughs> it's a totally different ball game. Uh, no, Chris... Seriously, when I think about it, is there a relationship between marijuana and religion? You know, surprisingly, uh, um, I would say that there's references to cannabis in uh, some of the most uh, existing world religions, uh, religions like Hinduism. Cannabis is used by sadhus in India in honor of Shiva, who's the oldest continually worshipped god on earth. In Taoism... We have references going back 2,500 years to cannabis incenses and uh, uh, preparations in drinks called an elixir of immortality. Uh, um, in Sikhism, the Nihang Sikhs particularly uh, um, partake of a drink of cannabis called Sukhadun. Um, and uh, in Buddhism, there's myths about the Buddhism that are thousands of years old uh, about the Buddha subsisting on one hemp seed a day while he sat under the Bodhi tree. Um, and uh, one of the more controversial things that I've written about are references that Sula Bennett, uh, an anthropologist writing in the 30s, uh, um, suggested were references to cannabis in the Hebrew religion, uh, Judaism, a, a term cannabosim. And that's a really fascinating subject when you look at her suggestions in the context of the biblical storyline. Zoroastrianism as well. There's ancient texts uh, referring to the use of cannabis in Zoroastrianism. So these are all existing religions. And then back in the ancient world, you know, we have direct references to cannabis under various names that it, it was known by back then in, in relation to religious and magical context. So absolutely, well, let, let the me, ceremonial use of cannabis is older than any religion. Let me ask you this. Is it always or predominantly is it used as far as religion goes as what you can see as a form of enlightenment? You know, um, some cases... You know, it's lower dose and it's more about a communi communicative type thing. But in some cases, very powerful uh, um, extracts of cannabis uh, that would knock you right out. And more of like a shamanic journey where they would have like a dream and interpret that much like an aborigine does in Australia as they left their body and saw things. You know what I mean? Uh, Heaven and Hell come from the Ardu Virak, an ancient Gnostic text. Uh, where the guy drinks three cups of a bang-infused wine, cannabis-infused wine, and then has his vision of the afterworld. So, yeah, it depends. You know, in other cases, like, say, with Sufis and dervishes, uh, they would partake of cannabis and then uh, play music and recite poetry, you know? So it really depends. It's, uh, there's a lot of variation. <laughs> let, I, let, let me ask you this, because some might say then, you know what, maybe all religion's just a bunch of high guys sitting around a fire <laughs> 2,000 years ago, and none of it's real. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, this is uh, something I think, you know, okay, let me talk about you know, something that most Westerners will be aware of, and that's the biblical references, you know, and let's remember that Moses, of course, first meets the Lord in flames of fire from within a bush, right? Um, but uh, this burning bush uh, apparently told Moses to make this holy anointing oil. And um, this holy anointing oil, and this is, uh, uh, you know, in Exodus thirty twenty three in the Bible, um, uh, contained myrrh, cinnamon, uh, um, other spices, frankincense, this type of thing, and also this herb in Hebrew, known 
Oh. Can of balsam. A lot of Bibles now translated as fragrant cane. Some translated as calamus. And um, uh, Sula Bennett showed by tracing the modern term back, cannabis, back through history and through the Hebrew language and comparing it to similar terms in Assyria and Babylonia that were contemporary to that time, Kanabu, that this was a reference to cannabis. And in the story, Moses applies some of this oil on his body, and uh, there's about eight or nine pounds of cannabis and about a gallon and a half of olive oil. And uh, um, THC is thought to be fatty soluble, may pa pass through the skin, but he also applies some of this oil on the altar of incense. And he speaks to the Lord in the pillar of smoke over the altar of incense in an enclosed little tent called the tent of the meeting. And so when you throw cannabis into that tent with Moses, was Moses talking to God? Or was he maybe accessing an area of the subconscious or unconscious via some sort of psychoactive substance? Sounds like uh, he was. Shock. Sounds like he was hot. Bo sounds like that was the first <laughs> the hot, hot box. box. Yeah. box was a very common method of ingestion, and one of the cultures that the Hebrews were uh, in trade with was a group known as the Scythians, and the Scythians were uh, amongst the first people to domesticate the horse, the first people it's thought to be. And this was largely thought to have come about by the development of hemp ropes around, I don't know, probably about 5,000 uh, 5, B.C., somewhere around there, you know, uh, um, 3,500 maybe, actually probably about 3,500 B.C. And, um, you know, when we're talking about cannabis, Carl Sagan speculated that cannabis was probably humanity's oldest agricultural crop. The word cannabis itself, the root word for it, canna, is older than Indo-European languages. When I say Indo-European languages, this is the common language that French, German, English, Sanskrit, and India, many, many other languages are derived from. The parent language of that, cannabis as a word, was already existing when that came into place, and it's a proto-Indo-European word. And it's thought to have uh, um, come about in the same area where they were uh, domesticating the horse. And that's why the spread of cannabis and the similar linguistics for it spread out throughout the area just because these guys were nomadic. And their descendants, the Scythians, who were riding around on horses and burning cannabis, would uh, heat up stones in a fire, place these in a brazier, take that, put it inside a teepee-like tent that they had covered with a carpet, and then let throw cannabis on that, and that, that would capture the fumes, and then they'd go inside the tent and inhale it. And that was a common method of uh, ingestion in the ancient world. Same with temples. Oftentimes, it was such a huge amount of cannabis burnt, the whole temple was filled with smoke. Wow. And uh, this was because pipes and bongs were yet to be invented. That was thought to come about after the yeah. uh, New World and, and, and the discovery of tobacco smoking. Well, obviously, you're extremely, extremely passionate about the research and the findings that you found through, uh, all, yeah, I guess your studies of this. So exactly how did you get into writing about this and what was kind of the driving force behind it that really, you know, striked your passion? Um, well, you know, uh, around 1989, 1990, I had a very powerful experience uh, uh, under the influence of cannabis. It had to do, it was right around the time I was finding out about the industrial uses of hemp and uh, uh, the importance that, that we needed for it for environmental purposes. Here in Canada, particularly, we were cutting down all our old growth forests and putting them into a pulp mill. We can make all our paper out of hemp, right? Uh, things like that. Uh, um, I had this really powerful experience on, on under cannabis. And I was trying to decide if there was anything to that experience or whether that was just my own you know, like I was just tripping out under the influence of cannabis, you know, and I thought, well, if there was anything to it, then somebody somewhere will have written about it. And so I started reading books on the history of cannabis and many accounts, you know, there's many accounts. I'm not the first person by any means to write about the role of cannabis in religion. Most of my research is based on the work of other scholars, archaeologists, anthropologists, that sort of thing. Uh, um, I just started kind of really collecting it and uh, putting it into one place and then trying to, you know, make, make, make some sort of context so I could understand uh, the role of cannabis in these different religions, understand them enough, you know, that I could understand how, what, what the relevance was. Chris, I think we've got a question from a, a viewer. We do. We have a question here from Bobby, and it says, how does this affect our freedom? I'm a veteran of the Vietnam and drug wars. Although uh, ge geographically separate, the city-states of London, the Vatican, and the District of Columbia are one interlocking empire called Empire of the City. The flag of Washington's District of Columbia has three red really? stars, one for each city-state in the three-city empire. So. Well, you know, really, Bobby, um, really, Bobby, that's your question, Bobby, really? 
That's just off the top of your head, Bobby, really. Whew. Interesting. Sorry, Chris, Sounds go closer. ahead. Yeah, I'd say, you know, in regards to freedom, you know, like I, I actually went to federal court here in Canada for religious use of cannabis. Uh, um, lost the case, appealed, but I could go back to court and back to where I started with it. But uh, um, I would say that the use of cannabis is even more of a fundamental right than freedom of religion because we're talking a plant, about a plant here that we have been using for tens of thousands of years according to the latest archaeological evidence. According to uh, Elizabeth Whalen Barber, who's probably the foremost authority on agent textiles, people have been processing cannabis for fiber going back to about 25,000 years ago. So we're talking about a plant that we've been using uh, and ingesting for 5,000, 6,000 years at least, uh, um, based on archaeological evidence, uh, that we have this natural relationship. It's an important medicine, possibly the first medicine. Cannabis appears in the oldest pharmacopias in the world, in the Pen Sao in China, in Ayurvedic references and medical texts and from ancient Egypt and Assyria. Uh, we're talking about a plant that we have had a natural relationship with for thousands and thousands of years. And it's like our right to air and water. This is life on earth and people and our relationship with the natural world. And step out of the way when it comes to the plants. Humanity has a natural right to the plants of the earth. Uh, Chris, uh, we, we are out of time. Thank you so Thank much you. for uh, spending some of your afternoon with us. We really appreciate it. A wealth of knowledge, too. Yes. You know, for While I was away in Paris, yes. Shane, I heard that he got to do a tour to a dispensary. I personally have never stepped foot in one. Oh, well then this is perfect I'm for excited you. to see kind of where you were and what you were doing. And well, you know, sometimes you drive by them and you see them on, on the street corners. You see that sometimes there's a couple on the same block and, you know, one looks uh, one way and another one looks like it's got darkened windows. You never really know where you should go in. It can be intimidating at times. Do you know what you're getting into? And if you've never been into one, as you mentioned, would you be scared to walk into one in the first place? So we thought, you know, we would help uh, pull back the veil and uh, take you inside a dispensary. <laughs> Hey, Don. Hey, Shane. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Listen, thanks for having us over. We appreciate it's it. It's a pleasure having you here. I'll tell you what, walking in here, it's not anything what I would expect. You know, you think of the dark windows and everyone's doing something shady, oh, but I it's know. like walking into any other store. I know, it's fabulous. Uh, you know what? To make things easy for people that have never been in a dispensary and have never gone into one and aren't sure what to do exactly, let's say I came in, okay. never been in, and I'd go, hey, you know what, Don? Uh, I'm, I'm kind of stressed out. I'm having trouble sleeping. How can you help me out? Well, uh, I would uh, start you off by asking if you uh, consume it by smoking. And if you did, then I would bring you... Is that the most popular? Yes, it is the most popular. There's lots of choices, but people it's, still it, like yeah, to smoke them. Yeah, it's mostly okay. cannabis, right? Okay, so, so what are we looking at? Here we have uh, Indicas, which are in the blue label. And they're for relaxation, uh, having dinner, watching a movie, sleeping. And it, it, it gives you a stress relief as well as pain relief. So it's very effective. Right, and then the, okay. the next we have a, a, a blend, which is a mix of uh, hybrid uh, hybrids, which are indicas and sativas, which are down here. So what's so, the what, what is? Well, the, the hybrids are a blend of the two. So what it is is it's, it's a, 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 a restful one and and. A, energetic one. So you have the two of them, uh, they, they blend them together. Okay, okay. Is that, that, is that a popular? Yeah, it's a very cross? popular, yeah, because yeah, it's a mix between the two. You know, it's right. kind of a daytime, afternoon thing, right? Right. And then the, the daytime buzz, yeah, sure. Yeah, yes, daytime the daytime thing, buzz, right? yes. So, okay, and then over here in the red label, uh, we, we have uh, the operators of the, the sativas, which get you, you want to jog down the street, you want to do a painting, you want to write a book, or any of that kind of stuff, right? You're still functioning, you're still moving, you're not yeah. just sitting on the couch. That's right, yeah, Watching yes. the movie, I see what you mean. Well, yeah, that's the other one, yeah. Now, what if someone, uh, you, you know what, they don't want to smoke it? They've okay. never smoked a, a joint before, and they're a little uh, concerned about that, they're not comfortable doing that, sure. how else can they? Okay. Well, they can consume it by eating it. That's uh, another way of eating. Right. Uh, so here we have like the jelly bombs. We have like... So what are these? Just like 
like candies, jelly candies? Well, or? They're, yeah, they're a jelly bomb. They're, 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 these are some of them for sleeping. It's right. The one with the Zeds on it. Well, oh, I that. see. Okay. Yeah, and these ones here for the day. Oh, I and see. The CBD, also, THC, yeah. Yeah. the variety of which depending on Because some so, people just want the CBD. Yeah, they don't want to get high. And, right. And, and, and the thing is, it's not really the high that happens. What happens is you get relief from your symptoms, and the side effect is a bit of a high, as opposed to, you know, heart palpitations, sudden death, and all this kind of stuff, right? Right. So, uh, the, and then uh, here we have a Rasta bar, which is uh, it's, a, it's just a, like a, a chocolate bar. The advice right. for people with these would be break off a little bit, have some, yeah. see how you react before stomach, you go yeah. to the next one. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, before I leave you, what is that, a dab bar? Is that yeah, what they call it? Yeah, that's the dab bar there. So what, 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 what is that? Well, it's a concentrate. So, so people don't have to consume the paper, the glue on the paper, the plant material, the chlorophyll, and have 10 puffs. They can have one shot, uh, which would uh, give them the same equivalent amount of medication. So it's a, it's a much safer and easier way of... Uh, of Before I do some window shopping myself, your staff can ha- answer any questions someone oh, might have. If you, know, if you know nothing, yeah, you can come in and they will take they care of you. absolutely help you out. Between all this, the people that are in this industry, we have thousands and thousands of years of knowledge and experience. Don, thank you so much. My pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Highly educational. Shane, highly I hope you weren't uh, testing the products. Highly, huh? highly educational. <laughs> Our thanks to a Don Briere and a Carol Gwilt. Uh, of course, it's a Weeds uh, Glass. G- g- glass weeds, and Co. G- glass, glass and Gifts. And Event- Gifts. Exactly, it's glass and gifts. It actually inside though, it's it's quite nice. It's, it's kind of I I would expect it to be when I think of you know, what a dispensary would look like. Yes, in my mind, it's a little different. That looks dark. like an upscale kind of lounge and you could right. go and You're spend the afternoon with the girls. Yeah. You're walking into Holt Renfrew. <laughs> I'm a little smorgasbord. Uh, and yeah, but you know what was fascinating was, uh, and again, we've heard the term uh, uh, potista for barista mm. or um, uh, can- canista, I've heard. And someone else, what was the business one you said? The business one is a ga- gondrepreneur. A and I was doing some stuff, some research last night and that's what they call people who open up you know, their own dispensaries or growing, they're entrepreneurs. I love it. The people inside, educated. They're making sure, because there's a lot of people that walk in for the first time. And again, whether you say, you know, you're, you're looking for something recreational, you're looking for something medical, you want to have the information to make uh, the right choice, and there is so much. Our thanks to Don and Carol for uh, bringing us in. Uh, also, uh, the, the uh, provincial government still continuing to collect your thoughts uh, and concerns leading up to legalization. Of course, uh, July 2018 looks like uh, when we will get there. Prior to that, though, uh, a lot of the provinces across the country, including here in BC, trying to hear from the residents about what they're uh, concerned about, what they'd like to see, what they don't want to see. Uh, you see the uh, address there on the uh, screen. It's gone already. And make sure you get involved because the rules are going to be made. And if you wait too long if and you, don't you have take ideas, part, you can't yeah. complain. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, and time is running out, so uh, make sure you, uh, you uh, hit uh, the website. So now in studio, we are joined by uh, mother and daughter, uh, Haley and Cheryl Rose. It's so nice to have the two of you on the show. It's been a real struggle. Uh, we, we heard earlier that you were diagnosed when you were six, I believe, with two types of epilepsy. And it seems like it's just been an absolute struggle ever since. Can you tell us a little bit of you know, your first experiences with, uh, I guess, pharmaceuticals or the experience there? Um, our first experiences was when she was six, between six and seven, they tried a few different pharmaceuticals. They were not working. They didn't seem, they didn't really know exactly what was going on at that point. Um, thought it was seizures, 100% sure. Tried her on a few different seizure meds. It wasn't helping. How many helping. seizures was, was um, In the beginning, uh, they were kind of sporadic, so it wasn't... Like they were always happening. It kind of um, progressed and it, it escalated uh, over the years. So. How terrifying is it for, for those that are, are watching and will watch the show later? How terrifying is it to watch? Well, How scary is it for you? Well, yeah. Last time, um, I scared lots of people on the airplane oh. having a seizure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're really bad, and I felt bad for scaring their kids. You felt no, that. Oh, no. no. Well, they're just little kids, and, I, and they were all staring at me, and they had the fright of the look, and they were so afraid. How scary was it for you? To me, I don't. I don't feel anything, but I feel right. bad for scaring all those. If, if, if they're scaring other people with it. 
I don't want to scare them. No, Aww. I appreciate that. What about you, Mom? How scary is it for you? Um, well... Especially at the beginning, I imagine. Mind you, maybe the, it doesn't get yeah. any easier ever. It doesn't. I mean, you, you... The only difference from the beginning is in the beginning, you have no idea that that's going to happen. And, that, and then over the years, I, it's been 18 years now, but still, every time my heart just jumps, it you constantly are on edge, uh, you know, waiting for the next one to strike. And when they happen, it's, you know, part of you wants to cry, part of you, you just like, you know, can't breathe. It, uh, every parent that, uh, uh, Dr. Kevin Farrell, he was the head of neurology when we started there at BC Children's. He told me he's never met a parent, especially a mother who doesn't have PTSD due to yeah. the stress and, and the anxiety that is brought about. I mean, you're watching your child because of the type of condition. You have no idea, are they going to come out of it? Are they not? You know, where is this going to lead? So, sorry, just because you talk about the stress, and so you talk yeah. about the stress of dealing with the condition, what about the stress in dealing as you're looking for help? <laughs> Different kind of stress, yeah. but I would think just as uh, overwhelming. Yeah, it, it is, because a lot of times, um, when you're dealing with these type of seizure, severe seizure conditions, um, there's, they, everything they're doing is just basically educated guesses. Yeah. Um, because there's only so many things out there, and they can try them, there's things that are, you know, well, we know that this type of drug might help more. Or this one might, and we try them, and, you know, whether or not they work, you never really know. And you, I, I looked all over for doctors all over, and I really didn't get any different answers from anywhere around the world. So, so after, so we obviously talked a little bit earlier, yeah. and you, you were saying that you yourself had decided that you wanted to try the route of trying cannabis mm -hmm. and that you had gone to California, you were searching for a doctor, somebody who could help. And yeah. eventually the first time you were able to give it to your daughter, can you kind of describe that day and how that felt? And I was terrified because I was about to break the law and uh, give my daughter medication that I couldn't find at any doctor anywhere that was willing to even look at. Um, the reason why I chose to do that was because in January, I think it was January 6th, 2008, I was told that my daughter was most, don't plan on school for September, and she would not be here for Christmas. The, the and she's what, year. eight then? She was, um, she was 15 when they told me that I had to start grief counseling and prepare for her to say goodbye. And look at you now. Oh yeah. <laughs> Grown up into a beautiful young lady. So Within, obviously at that point you go, I got no choice. Like if, if not now, when? Well, it was uh, five months, about five months after they told me that. And I just went, you know what? The only thing, I, I'm going to lose my daughter no matter what, if I have to try. And it was the single most best decision I've ever made in my life. Yeah. Has, um, we tried every single med and there was this last med and it didn't uh, it help. So that's when we had to start trying cannabis because that was our only last hope. Yeah, yeah there was, it, it was a last resort. And quite honestly, cannabis needs to be thought of as a first option, not a last resort. And because um, we tried every single one and that was our last one we tried, every single pill, um, that was the only way out was to get the medicine because the, the last pill didn't even help at all. And the right. other pills um, that were in, that all, that are all there, that all them, they weren't, they, working. Weren't, they weren't working, they weren't helping at all. They were just, some of them were, were causing hallucinations mm -hmm. and really bad ones one time hallucination. I was picking diamonds on my skin. I thought I had diamonds in my skin yeah, and they, I kept on picking it out. And some of them were really severe. Then I had to the, and, it, and that's yeah. this kind of type of seizure. Aye. That's Aww. a certain I type of seizure. I bet you're happy your mom like forced through and, and did that to get you onto the cannabis. Yeah, right? it's another way how you can do a seizure and <laughs> you can have a seizure um, really easily. Yeah. Because one of the seizures I even have is um, have a ventilating. Yeah, when she yeah. was young. She yeah. 
And yeah. I can still maybe do it a little, but not as much. Yeah. yeah. They're different seizure types. She has five different seizure types. So. Wow. Quality of life before and after. <laughs> Apple, like, can you, you're laughing like it's not even a question. Yeah. You can't even. Um, before, every time she sees, we didn't know how much was coming back. We were literally losing her every time she seized. I didn't know what abilities were gonna come back. I had no idea if she was gonna come back because she goes into sub, uh, subclinical, uh, non it's non-convulsive epileptic, sta uh, status epilepticus. And it's, so you have, you don't even know, she just is like catatonic. Um, so it, yeah, you, you just don't know. You never really know how much is coming back. Is she gonna make it the next time? And it, to now, I mean, the difference, I mean, right. she's talking, she's uh, reading. The, the leaps and bounds over, uh, we're, we're gonna be a decade in uh, May this year of Haley using medical cannabis. And I can tell you the long-term effects are amazing. The, the ability to learn, uh, retain, I mean, you just yeah, it's, really um, great. When I was younger and, and I didn't take um, um, Haley's comment or any other meds like that, um, I had troubles reading and now that I've been on it, I can read a book that has 799 Pages. Wow. Awesome. And I used to only be able to read books like this thin, oh. and this wow. thin, and this thin, and then this thin. And now but you can read I an encyclopedia. Read before. <laughs> I had to have lots of help back then because there was lots of um, things, but I wasn't that good at reading or drawing or that much stuff. Maybe drawing more, but reading was too hard. For yeah. me, that back then, but now I can read perfectly now because of, the, cause of awesome. the medicine. Cheryl, do you ever get mad that it took you breaking the law to get the help you needed before? Oh, finally? Yeah. Like now, obviously, things are evolving now, and things are different than when you started, obviously. My biggest regret but, was not breaking the law sooner. Yeah, so I was wondering. It, it, straight up, I, uh, it is my number one regret that was not breaking the law sooner in order to give it to her when I first thought, you know, hey, maybe we better look at this. Um, I really wish I had. I am so happy to see so many children and families now, and, you know, just in general, people who are finding incredible health benefits and quality of life and quantity of life, just, it, it's, it's wonderful to see it, you know, over these last how many years, especially the children, right? Is it really, it, it really, is about being a first line of defense instead of a last line of defense. What would you say to um, family members, anyone pretty much watching the show who are reluctant or against it? And because there's still a lot of people who are quite close-minded to the thought, especially giving it to a child, right? The, what would you say to somebody like that? When when you look at your options between medical cannabis and you're looking and whether or not it's a high CBD, a THCA strain, or a THC and CBD isn't just the only one that helps seizures. There really is an entourage effect, and different people need different ratios of the uh, different cannabinoids and the terpenes in it. Um, what I say is Dilantin, uh, majorly, as well as the other medications she has, cause severe osteoporosis and uh, deterioration of literal jaw bones. Um, as well, as well as other medical uh, issues. Um, she has to take different supplements and stuff now as well to try combat 18 years of pharmaceuticals. Um, the side effects that you can have with some of these pharmaceuticals that we have to give our children are severe addiction and the potential to kill them. And as I said, it's all educated uh, guessing is what the doctors have to do. And they are basing that based on what they think will work. Well, with cannabis, you it's not going to deteriorate your bones. It's not going to cause those specific things that long-term pharmaceuticals can. So if you can start with a natural medicine like that, you are much better off if, if you end up having to, because the, these are a monster of conditions, if you end up having to utilize another, you know, pharmaceuticals, because some people do, like Haley, she still requires some, at least you've 
gone the first step with trying to avoid having to. And if you have to add them in, it might be a few years down the road, right. so you're less damaged. And that's really what's important. And a lot of people go, oh, but the doctor said this pill. Read up on what that pill can actually do. Um, I've had nurses yell at me going, how did you find out that drug does that? And I went, you know what, I looked it up. Yeah, exactly. They're <laughs> always amazed when you look something up. They didn't even want me to know. <laughs> so. Tell us about the Haley Rose Foundation. Well, um, it was started uh, based on what Haley, Haley wanted to see and the fact that our, our struggle in trying to get access to it and wanting to see other access and wanting to see research done. And we worked with the incredible Dr. Paul Hornby. And Haley said, you know... Can I say? No. <laughs> I said, yep. they asked me, um, they gave me some, they were giving me it. I don't mean to me, but I told them maybe you should think of giving it to other people even if they don't have enough money. Like, for example, people who live on the street, they need to get well. And if I mean, it's going to help them get well, the longer you wait, the longer it's going to take to get them well, and then at some point it's going to be too late. That's why I. I just put my foot down and just said, Good for you. and just said, help the others, even if they don't have any money or to live on the street, because some people can't pay for it, and some people can, but then again, some people live on the street that can't, that have really, either, um, they are too sick or um, in pain and stuff, because you get really hurt, and so people on the street, deserve to have that too, or even like yeah. people who like barely have any money or sure. even who don't have money. Oh, that's if, I, a, if I didn't do that, they, would? wouldn't have still, they wouldn't have shared it with everyone. They would have shared it just with me. And, well, it, it was going out, but Haley's... But I mostly really, had to yeah. put my foot down to do it. And yeah, she was like, Mom, I want you to make sure that if anybody can help, you have to help them. So, I, I so that was, that was quite a big task she gave you. <laughs> yeah, it, it was. It was, I you have them. to help them. You have to make sure they get access to yeah, medicine. Yeah, I asked them to like, think about it first and tell me what you think about, and then they agreed with me. Yeah, awesome. but then I got this all done. <laughs> such a brave thing. Awesome. Yeah. I don't know. You're doing that. You're you're worried about how the kids on the airplane. How, if you're scaring <laughs> them, you're unbelievable. You you think more about other people I think, than almost all of us do. I think about more about other people. Ever since when I was little, I always wanted to help people like that, like people who, um, um, like people who don't even have homes or barely any clothes and bad water. I always and wanted sometimes to help. That's been my dream to help people to get well instead of having them suffer. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to ha help people, but since I was too young back then, and not have anymore. So no, you have not anymore. Now, now, now you're, you're all yeah. grown up. No, I'm just. That's awesome. Doing that now. I think we have a question from. We uh, do. The audience. We have a question here. It's from Elena, and she asks. Haley, how did you take your medicine while you were attending school? I had to use um, a, a vaporizer, and then I used a vaporizer pen. And you also took capsules as well. Yeah, capsules. Yeah. It's amazing how that technology, like as you said, when we were talking before the show, you had to buy one of those volcano vaporizers. Yeah, because like, that's what was out. That was the technology, and in that decade, whether it's pills, the vaporizer pen, like it's amazing how things have changed and have made it easier. So it's for also you. the vaporizer pen that um, I for had school. before then. And then I did the can of cap. Right. Yeah, well actually we got the Those can of caps into the school system. Vaporizer took a little bit longer to get in, mm -hmm. but um, there was, we, uh, Dr. Paul Hornby and our doctor uh, created a protocol and then I worked with teaching the nurses and the staff how to administer it, load and unload right. the vaporizer. And it actually was allowed in the classroom to be administered as needed for emergency purposes. So Tracy asks, awesome. um, are there, do you know any other young people or have you met anyone who also, or who are also using cannabis? Yes, oh, I yeah. do. <laughs> and he's sicker than me. There's yeah. a, yeah, there's um, he's several. He's very sick. And he has some of them, 
like kind of seizures. Mm -hmm. He takes the same and he takes Haley's condom like me. And but he 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 he's a he has a really bad one that um, before he couldn't um, keep contact, but now he can. But he still ha has lots of trouble and like you but know how not. some people um, <laughs> usually are like blacked out and they're like kind of you kind of have to make it look like a like acted out ba like baby stuff. Yeah. Because some of them go like this, and they're not like, paying attention right. really, and, yeah. and they can't understand and, and talk to you or something, and they just have to go like this. Right. They're, and, yeah, they're having a harder time yeah, communicating. Yeah. I have a friend that is like that, and it's very sad because he had lots of seizures back then, and he doesn't have lots, but he still has tons and he tons of seizures, some, yeah. a lot more than me. You and know, there's, uh, there's other families and children that we've met throughout the way. You've got a few other friends um, and kids that have been using her strain as well as other strains, different right. CBD. I, I guess it's a trial and error kind of thing, yeah. too. You're it is. It's very individual to yeah. each individual person as to what they actually need. Right. But we've gotten the pleasure to meet uh, multiple families and get to, to meet their kids and hear their stories. And oh, wow. It, that's one of the best things. So the Haley Rose Foundation, uh, we had the address up there a couple check of times. You can go to it, you can check it out, uh, get involved, help in any way. Uh, I got to say, this is uh, six weeks in. Haley, you're my favorite guest yeah. we've had so far. Uh, you're fantastic. So I really want to say thank you so much for coming in. I can't, uh, you, I should think about other people as much as you do. I would be a better person. So thank you very much. Yeah. We and really appreciate it. thanks for coming you. all the way out. Yes. To come sit with us on the new white coach. And Cheryl, yes, thank you too. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and thank you for raising you. such an amazing daughter who's yes. obviously you know, making changes in, in the world. Yeah, no, all yeah. of us. Thank you so much. Uh, Haley and uh, Cheryl Rose, and again, uh, you can uh, check out the foundation, the uh, Haley Rose uh, Foundation. Uh, you can go online, uh, check it out, see if you want to get involved in what you can do uh, to help. Our thanks to, of course, uh, Haley and Cheryl Rose for joining us, uh, Chris Bennett. Yes. Uh, author, cannabis historian, focusing on the relationship between cannabis and religion. Uh, he joined us uh, via Skype. Uh, thanks to again Don Breer and Carol Gwilt for taking tour. us on the tour yeah. of uh, the we, uh, dispensary, uh, Weeds, uh, Glass, and Gifts. Uh, tell the folks who's coming up next week. Next week we have Ross Ribliati, who you guys all probably have heard yes, that Yes, we name. all remember Ross Ribliati. <laughs> we all remember that. And so, yeah, he's going to be joining us next week, which is super exciting. We're excited to hear, yeah, yeah ask I'll, some questions. Yeah, we're going to hear from uh, Ross. Uh, he's very involved, uh, has his own uh, strain of medical marijuana. Ross will join us. We'll talk about that. Plus, immigration uh, lawyer uh, Len Saunders is going to join us. We'll talk to him. You know, so many Canadians uh, probably have, uh, might have a, uh, a charge, uh, 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 something from their youth uh, that may be involved uh, recreational marijuana. All of a sudden, it's on their record. Now they can't go to the States. They can't cross the border with their family. They can't go on a vacation. All kinds of issues. Uh, we'll get to the bottom of that and what sort of uh, recourse there is for uh, folks that might have to deal with that. Otherwise, uh, wow, it always flies by. Another I Thursday know. Is over. Another Thursday at 420 Pacific Time. Yep. And we'd like to thank you for watching us here at THC Live. See you next week.